For Phil and Lynn McLean, a new life in West Africa seemed like paradise. But when they fell victim to an elaborate con, their world fell apart. Phil was beaten, arrested, became a fugitive, then a prisoner. I was one kick away from possibly being killed. The man I love, I may never see again. Lynn! I've been fishing from the Port of Williams most of my life, and I could see the industry collapsing, declining fast. I never really liked Weymouth much because it was really very quiet. I was having a, a bad time in my relationship, um, to the point where divorce was inevitable. I'd had a bad marriage. It broke down. Then I met Phil. It was love at first sight for me, anyway. <laughs> To be honest with you, it didn't take too long to fall in love with her. Phil wanted to make a, a change in direction as much as I did. I was originally born in Rhodesia, um, spent the first part of my life there. I think it's fair to say that I had a yearning to go back. I liked Africa. I was always interested in Africa when I was younger. Phil sold his house, and we sold the fishing vessel that we had in the Weymouth Harbour. When we seen that go, we knew that was the beginning of a new start for us. We were off. I was happy just to get away from everything. And we decided the place we wanted to go to make the start was Africa. Eighteen years ago, Phil and Lynn arrived in Gambia with their life savings, full of hope for the future. When we first arrived in Gambia, we immediately fell at home and, you know, fell in love with the place. The people were so welcoming, kind, warm. Popular with tourists and travellers, Gambia seemed the perfect place to pursue their dream of running a motel together. One of our uh, good friends in Gambia knew he was on the lookout for some sort of business and pointed out a motel which is going to be coming up for lease. It was totally run down. The paint was falling off the walls. There wasn't a proper kitchen. I think there was four tables, dust on the floor, when the barman slumped over the bar asleep. There were people sleeping outside in hammocks on the front, clothes on the floor. But I've got a good imagination. I, I could see it in about two minutes. That would be perfect. Although we knew there was a lot of money to be spent. But I thought we, we could really make something of this. We were probably about to use the best part of our life savings. I think friends, family, thought we were a tad crazy uh, taking on this project, especially investing into a country we didn't know. But then I felt we wanted to be ourselves, do what we wanted to do. It did cost more than we thought. In the end, I think we closed to 70,000 pounds spent on the place. As soon as we opened the doors, the customers just came from nowhere. They were coming from 20 kilometers away. They were coming from the city. It was swinging. It was a really happy evening. We felt we'd become part of the community. You know, we felt at home.
For the next few weeks, the motel flourished. This guy walked into the bar, uh, struggled, staggered into the bar. I could clearly see he wasn't well, and my immediate thoughts were to help him. He introduced himself as Nick. He seemed quite a nice chap. He said, I'd like a cup of tea if you don't mind. He'd explained that he lost his job. He'd been living on the streets the last couple of three days. He wasn't well. So I offered him a room, which we had an empty room. I think Lim was Nick's saviour, basically doing a nursing job, really, and she looked after him well. After a few days, um, he was better. He was up and about on his feet. He made himself very useful. He was helping around the place. Nipping behind the bar and doing the job when the barman had gone elsewhere. Uh, he just fitted in. Nick and Phil got on really well. I was quite happy for that because Phil hadn't actually met many people. And it was great, actually, to have um, Nick about. We both agreed he was a good asset for the business. Nick, I swear, was a magician. He was very good at card tricks. Excellent. But he always liked to do it for money. He'd always have a bet. You could fool anybody, any time. You could bet on it. You'd never win against Nick. But the locals loved it. Uh, he could keep customers amused all day long. We had another guy come in the bar. His name was John. When he first started drinking in the bar, you couldn't help noticing because we're in a predominantly Muslim country and he used to drink Guinness. He was a quiet guy. He'd sit there on his own. But he became a regular customer and blended in after a while. And he seemed a very nice chap. John and Nick seemed to know each other. They'd go through to the back rooms, um, out of earshot, I always thought. Sometimes I picked up on a couple of sort of kind of strange conversations. Unusual things about money and quite vast amounts of money. They would talk millions. When I would go in, they would stop talking. Something wasn't ringing right to me. Lynn said, you're spending too much time with this, John. And, and it seemed a bit shady, she said. My answer to that was, perhaps you're being a little paranoid. Just don't worry about it, he said. Nick's fine, don't worry about him. Why should I be suspicious? They hadn't done anything wrong. But Lynn's intuition told her differently. Should have listened. Lynn and Phil McLean's Gambian Motel was flourishing. They were planning a trip back to the UK and their friend Nick had a proposition. Nick approached me and uh, just asked me as simple as you might ask someone when they're going down a shop. Do you mind me doing me a favour? Nick was asking the favour on behalf of John. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, if you're up in London, a couple of stones, he said, worth, you know, two, three hundred pounds. You can drop into a friend of mine there, a jeweller. If you bring the money back, he said, I can help repay you for all you've done. He described him, if I remember rightly, as a a couple of mellows, which are okay, so. very small diamonds. I said, oh, I said, all right. I said, well, when we do go back, yeah, no problem. Taking Nick's precious stones with them, Lynn and Phil set off back to Britain thinking they were leaving the motel in safe hands. But when they got back, Nick's stones turned out to be not so precious after all. For about a second week I was up in London, I took him to dress Nick had given, 
spoke to the guy in there. He took one look at him and said, well, they're topaz. And he said, uh, 50 pound, he said, if you're lucky. Hmm. I said, well, I, I told the small diamonds. He said, no. He said, topaz. He said, no, I don't deal in topaz. He said, so I'm not going to buy them. And I thought nothing of it and walked out, carried on what I was doing in London, went back to Weymouth. We had a phone call from a friend which owned a um, nightclub just down the road from us in the Gambia. She said, there's trouble at the motel. I think you need to make your way back and sort it out. So we decided that Phil would go back a couple of days before me and that I would stay in the UK and finish off what business had to be finished. I couldn't imagine what could have gone wrong. As I drew up against the motel, everything looked fairly normal. clearly see that the place has been ransacked, locks have been broken, doors have been broken open. I think practically everything had gone, uh, the, the whole caboose. Even lampshades were missing. Furniture, curtains, tables, chairs, drinks, food. I went into our office. That was bare. I can remember my stomach churning over, just wondering the reason why. When I turned round and saw John approaching me, John was, was shouting, where's my diamonds? Where's my money? You stole my diamonds. I said, I haven't stolen your diamonds. I still have your diamonds. I said, they're not diamonds, they're topaz. Uh -uh. Those are not my diamonds. I want my diamonds. And I threw a question. I said, you're not responsible for, for all these things missing, are you? He said, it's all mine. He said, until you pay me, he said, you don't get them back. I said, pay you what? He said, four million dollars. That's a quarter of a million pounds. I thought the guy must be crazy. And then uh, a couple of henchmen laid into me and beat me to the floor and kicked me. And kicked me hard, too. I want my diamonds! My first thoughts were to, to go to the local police station and try and get him arrested. And that's where I went. Very, very angry. I said, you know, we've got the motel around the corner. I've been robbed, broken into, all the things are gone. I explained that it seemed that John was responsible for stealing all the things. And it was almost like a, a piece of magic that appeared from nowhere. John walked out of the room and he was laughing. And that put the shiver up my backbone. That's him. That's the man. And that's when I figured out this has all been planned. I got pushed into the cell. The stench was terrible. There was one bucket between eight people, which was overflowing. No seats, no benches. I remember thinking to myself, I've been stitched up. What do they want? Which was pretty apparent, of course. Money. It was a game they were going to be playing. And I was thinking to myself, I'd have to prepare myself for the morning. But the only thing is, I didn't get any sleep. The cell was undone. And they said to me, we're taking you into the CID room. You will get your chance to explain there. I felt quite encouraged that anybody who's slightly level-headed, certainly in the CID department, would understand what's happened. So I had a little bit of encouragement. Oh, B! Take a seat, my friend. Take a seat. 
He had a smile. First thing he said, ah, oh, Mr. Phillip, he said, what are you doing here? Why have they brought you here? Why don't you tell me all about it? Made me feel quite good. And every time I said so, oh, dear, he said, oh, really? You know? Oh, no, 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 you know. And he had in his hand a, a piece of paper which she asked me to look at. And it was a written statement. He said, all I want you to do is read this. He said, and sign it. I read it, and to much of my amazement, it was a confession of a charge of stealing two diamonds. And I said, what the hell do you think you're doing? I tore it up in front of him. He just slammed in like a, a bird on his prey. You were saved! You were saved! So he, he turned from Mr. Nice Guy straight away to Mr. Nasty. And I can't explain how nasty he was with it. He said, this is a serious charge. He said, we're talking four million Delassies. He said, it's my job to get the truth out of you. So I'm going to keep you in the station till I get the truth. Phil hadn't phoned me that day to tell me that he had arrived safely. I was beginning to get worried. Then another day went by, and I was getting pretty concerned now. I managed to sleep just maybe the odd 10 minutes, 15 minutes max, whilst the, the officers were out the room. But 10 minutes later, time for questioning again. Various ways they woke me. Usually a hard slam with a foot on the chair. Sometimes they're pushing my head up, slap on the back. Mr. Phillip, wake up. Time for questioning. During that period, I must have been questioned 50, 60 times. Over the period of six days. Same routine. Asked me to make a statement. Refused to make a statement. I understand the time right now, but you have to sign here. I never thought once of signing. Not at all. There's a lot of people which would have signed anything just to get out of there. Okay. We'll be better. I knew if I did that, there's worse to come. Not better. The phone rang, I answered it, and there was a strange voice on the end. It said that Phil was locked up in the police station and I wasn't to travel to the Gambia because it was too dangerous. I ran to the bathroom and I was absolutely violently sick. And being on my own was really difficult as well. I felt quite helpless. I'm sure she knew I could be dead. Wake up, wake up. Wake up, wake up. Wake up, wake up. Time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, Phil. 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 Phil, it's me. It's me, your lawyer. Lynn, I think, made other contacts and phoned our lawyer. He said, you know what serious trouble you're in, don't you? You could get 10 years in prison for this. Maybe I'm the only person which can help you. But like all things, you have to pay. And of course, I was carrying cash, and the police hadn't taken anything from me. And I made a payment to them of seven and a half thousand lassies in order to seek for my release or bail. He said, don't worry, he said, this time tomorrow, he said, you'll be free. And he disappeared. I think it was on the fourth or fifth day. I was taken outside onto the steps at the police station to be able to talk to my lawyer. And the lawyer said, Mr. Phillip, I've got bad news for you. He said, well, the truth is, I'm not acting on behalf of John now. He's paid me to act against you. I was speechless. 
Then I said to him, can I have my money back, please? The answer's no. Not only did he double-cross me, he stole the money. And that was our lawyer. After six days in police custody and exhausted after very little sleep, Phil was bundled off to court. At the magistrate's court, there was a variety of witnesses which appeared. There was John, of course, which is a complainant. And one of the main witnesses was Nick. I was officially being charged in court with the theft of two diamonds to the value of four million dollars, a quarter of a million pounds. The magistrate asked John to describe these diamonds, and his description of the diamonds was, they're as big as an egg. They were saying that I personally tested these diamonds and agreed with them they were worth four million dollars. If I didn't bring him the four million dollars, I would let him cut my throat. It seemed that the magistrate appeared to believe him. When Nick came to court, I didn't know what to expect. This was the man which Lynn and I had rescued, even saved his life. He's the man which was our best friend. He's the man we trusted. He told a pack of lies, a complete pack of lies. Nick said that I'd switched the diamonds and replaced them with something completely different. I just knew there and then that he was part of the conspiracy. I felt about Nick a total betrayal of what I classified only months earlier as being one of our best friends. Phil's case was adjourned. The court took his passport and he was released on bail. For the first time in six days, he was able to speak to Lynn. Phil had a lump in his throat, I could hear that. I was crying as well. And all I wanted to do was, you know, get back to the Gambia and see Phil. You know, I was missing him so much. But Phil continued to tell me that he didn't want me to come to the Gambia. He was told they would kill me. I explained to Lynn very clearly the threats from John and his cronies. If your wife comes here, I'll kill her. She's dead if she comes in this country. He spoke a few more words and the I love Jews. Then he said he had to go. And with that, we said goodbye. But I wasn't sure whether I'd ever really speak to him again. Freed on bail by a Gambian court, Phil McLean would soon face final judgment. I felt determined to go back to the motel. It's our motel, paid for. And I saw no reason why I shouldn't carry on running it. Regardless of the situation, don't run away. turned round and out of the blue, John stood there, no clothes, all apart from a thong, and he said, I've come to kill you. <laughs> he was chanting, spitting here and there and everywhere. I thought this guy's nuts, but he was being very, very serious. This guy was a witch doctor. This probably explained why he seemed to have such power over people. <laughs> but then out of the blue, his henchman lunged at me and just beat the crap out of me. 
It took three of them to do it. This time I fought back. I've got a couple of blows in, but three against one is not. No. And they kicked me to the ground, and they kicked hard. I lost uh, both of my dog teeth. I was bruised all around the rib cage. I was cut on the face, cut on the arms. I had boot burns on my chest. I was one kick away from possibly being killed. In fear of his life, Phil abandoned the motel. He took refuge in a friend's secure compound, well out of town. After three months apart, it finally seemed safe for Lynn to join him. It was like we'd been apart for a long time, and we were just so pleased to be together again. But the sense of safety lasted only a few days. He'd obviously found out where I moved to. And, and it started off with sticks being banged on the wall on the outside of the compound and tins and drums being beaten and whistles being blown. We could hear names being called, for sure. We knew it was directed at us. Phil! They actually got over the wall into the compound itself, and, and they started uh, dancing and chanting. It was terrifying. They were working up to a frenzy. We could see them going round, 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 round. The next thing we knew, there was a rustle on the roof. <laughs> and they were working their way through the grass roof, and then a, a pair of hands and arms appeared through the roof. Immediately, I just picked up the first thing, which happened to be a broom handle, and started hitting these hams. If we hadn't have um, fended them off, they, I think they probably would have entered the room. But it was pretty scary, you know. They all disappeared back over the wall, and, and that episode was over, but... Now we started not to feel safe there. Now that John had discovered their hideaway, they were both at risk, and Phil persuaded Lynn to fly home. The leaving is the hardest part, the departure. You know, I can't describe the hollowness which is lovely. Phil couldn't leave Gambia. The authorities still held his passport. And in just five days' time, he was due in court to face the verdict. I saw that the odds were well stacked against me. But I could see nothing but bad coming out of this. I stood to go to prison for 10 years, and, and I didn't like that idea. Faced with the prospect of prison, Phil came to a decision. He would go on the run, using illegal people smugglers to get him out of the country. You pay the right people, you take the route. You could be caught. For me, that would have been very bad news. Put in hands of the Gambian government trying to escape. I'd lose my bail and end up in the prison. His plan was to cross the border into Senegal, make his way to the coast, 
and charter a boat to Sierra Leone, where he had contacts who could get him back to England. But with his trial date looming, he had just five days to do it. You'd hit one tree on one side, and the vehicle would lurch to the other side, and, and then you hit another tree, and it banks it back into the track. And this is five hours like this. At the end of day one, Phil was over the border. But now, he was entering war-torn Senegal. So the journey was going uh, really quite well. But um, the vehicle started to slow down. And, and you could clearly hear the anxiety amongst the people I was traveling with. The person who said his passports, which is the one thing which I was dreading, because if I was caught, basically I'd be returned back to the Gambia. And at that point, I thought, plan B, quick. If it works out, well, why not bribe them? It's the only thing which is going to work for me. And I thought, so well, they could go either way. They could either say, no, what you're doing here, or they could take the money. I'm sure he could see I was shaking. It was my lucky day. They took the money. I thought, I've escaped one. How many more stops might there be? Phil reached the coast. Now he needed a boat to smuggle him to Sierra Leone. But the locals were nervous. I spent hours and hours haggling with the fishermen there. They would have run at a very high risk. They didn't know who I was, what I'd done, what I was escaping from. They seemed to think the money didn't outweigh the risk, and they didn't really want to take me. It was a severe blow. But Phil resolved to continue the escape on foot. Between him and Sierra Leone, lay 300 miles of jungle, swamp, and rebel territory. That entailed taking a, a bush trek through swamp area in the crocodile infested. I first met with mangroves, which took me hours to cross. And by then, I had actually crossed what I guess was the borderline into Guinea-Bissau. And then I met with the other side of the river, with the other mangroves. And at that stage, I thought, there's no way I'm going to get through this. I um, felt beaten, really. With just two days left before his trial, Phil had to face the inevitable. The escape had failed. He had no alternative but to turn back and face the court. I took what I think was the sensible decision to turn around and go back. But the other thing which led me to that decision is I had a, a feeling inside me that I should go back, if only just to clear my name. Phil was smuggled back into Gambia, just in time for Judgment Day. I can remember leaving about seven in the morning, and I thought I'd walk to the court. And I remember watching the birds as I walked past the trees and looking at life and nature and thinking, well, perhaps I might miss this. On the other hand, 
In two hours' time, I might be walking back up through this road. So I was walking into the unknown. The hearing was brief. Phil was found guilty and sentenced to six years in prison with hard labor. When he said those words, guilty, couldn't believe it. Shock and horror. You know, that, that they, they, they can actually even think of convicting anybody on this evidence. My first thoughts were uh, for Lynn, that she was going to be perhaps on her own for up to six years. It was like a nightmare. It was like my life had finished. And I was feeling it ever so deeply sorry for Phil. Phil's destination was Gambia's notorious state prison, mile two. Brutality immediately when I got in there. I was beating the cell with a, with a truncheon. A drastic place inside. And the death rate is very high, just on malaria alone. So I hear stories that I was the first white man to be in that prison in the last two years. The last white man was carried out in the box. Logic simply told me, I don't think I'm going to last the first month. Food was a bit scarce, I think, fed once a day. It usually consisted of a small bowl of rice and, and just a fish head. The hard labor which I'd been sentenced to soon became clear on my day one. It involved painting rice into a cuss. The stick probably weighed maybe 40, 50 pounds. I was pounding the food for the day for the prisoners within. And as you pounded the rice, so the flies pitched. And every time you come down with a piece of wood, which is like a hammer, you just squash the flies straight into the rice. And that somewhat put me off of my diet of rice and fish because I just knew what I was eating was rice, flies and fish. I'm not a big chap and I certainly lost a lot of weight and a lot of strength already. I could so easily have fallen very, very ill with exhaustion dehydration and malnutrition. So when the guards weren't looking, the inmates were good enough to take over for me and, and pound for me and, and sit me day and out of the sun, because one of the problems is it was done in the midday sun and it was maybe 40 degrees C. This strapping big chap, which was in the same cell as me, he said, if I whistle, he said, you get back up here now and carry on. I would have been in a really, really bad way without them. With the inmates' help, Phil had survived his first days in captivity, but he still had another six years to go. At Gambia's Mile 2 prison, Phil McLean had served two weeks of his six-year sentence. One of the guards came to the cell and, and shouted my name and said, Visitor! And everybody clapped their hands inside the cell and they said, you're very lucky. Nobody gets sisters here. To my surprise, I could see uh, Mr. Norman Manison. He was a British businessman who'd set up a company in the Gambia. We'd only just met him briefly, but he did say any time you ever need anything, just to call, and which I did. I called Norman. He was in a terrible, shocking state. They, they give him six years. I didn't think he would last six months. He convinced me of his honesty. And it was quite obvious to me that he had been set up and conned. What clinched it for Norman was the name of the man at the heart of the scam, a man he'd employed in Gambia, Nick. 
Nick was acting as our agent in Gambia, but it became apparent the man was an out-and-out -out con. I myself had been robbed for some £35,000. Nick's environment was very much with the mafias out there. He said, and I'm going to organise and try and get you some bail on appeal. And if we can get bail for you, he said, we can get you eight. But I cannot promise anything whatsoever. He said, but I can do my best. Norman's lawyer took on the case and lodged an appeal. A week later, Phil was released on bail. I was getting a round of applause from hundreds of inmates, so that made me feel good. I looked into the, the driver's mirror and I could see myself looking like somebody had been uh, abandoned on a desert island for two years and could have easily dived into a bin for food. That's what I looked like and felt like. Five months later, after a short hearing at Gambia's Supreme Court, the charges were thrown out and Phil was acquitted. He was free, free. I looked at Phil and Phil looked at me and, and it was, his face changed. I could see he was happy. It made me happy. And it was almost like a new life starting again. We were ecstatic about it, of course we were. Finally, justice had been done. The most emotional thing was when leaving the Gambia was passing the motel. I could hardly look at it, actually. I was happy to leave it behind me, but also upset at the same time. We'd lost our dream. We'd lost all hope, we'd lost everything. Even though we only had £10 in our pocket, we were together again, and that's all mattered. The dream of Gambia is long gone. But in Spain, Phil and Lynn have found a smaller, safer version of paradise. I mean, the most important thing is Lynn and I have got each other. And second to that is I'm still alive. And I value life probably better these days than I ever did before. We've got a perfect relationship. We're perfect friends. We're together today, and it's just great. Really, I'm quite content. But it's always in the back of the mind that, you know, we'll never get back what we had before. But it's only money. After all, it's only money. <laughs>